Hi, my name's Al Williams. I told you that we would take a look at the MP Lab X IDE and I thought we could do it with a video. You can see that the IDE is based on NetBeans, which is a Java program, so not surprisingly it runs nicely under Linux, which is the operating system I'm using. And I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to make a standalone project. Now I can pick any one of the pick devices here, but that's a very long list. So I'm going to narrow it down by picking mid-range 8-bit MCU. And I just happen to have a PIC16F886 connected to a board attached to this machine. And in fact, it's asking me if I've got it hooked up in different ways. An ICD3, a PIC kit 2, which it has partial support for, a PIC kit 3, which I actually have. Uh, realize the simulator has partial support, and the red things are things that it would support for other chips, but not for this one. So we'll pick the pick kit 3. And then there's a bunch of tool chains you can pick from, different C compilers, pick basic pro, the SDCC compiler, which is a freebie, and we're going to pick MPSM, which is the assembler. Okay, for project name, I'm just going to call this DDJ2. I'll set it as my main project. And we're ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and close this earlier one. So I've got DDJ2 here. Now I have no source files in here. There is, in fact, a template. And I went ahead and copied the default one in here already for the 16F886. These are a bunch of template files that ship with the assembler. Unfortunately, when you open this, there's a few things. First of all, the include file is case sensitive and it's got the wrong case sensitivity here. So if, you're, if you were on Windows, that probably would not matter. So that's something that I really should fix globally, but just for right now, that's how it comes out of the box. And also, this file isn't actually in your project yet. So I went ahead and picked a code. I didn't want to do the, the object file format here, so let's go ahead and fix up the project here. First thing I want to do is go ahead and save this. And unfortunately, it does not put you in the right directory. So I don't want to call it that either. I'm going to call this DDJ2 sim. Okay, I need to add that to the project. So you see here I have no source files. So I'm going to go ahead and say add an existing item. I need to bring up the project properties. And you can see there's different options for everything build in absolute mode because I don't want to use the relocatables. I need to set that and that should be it. So let's look at the template. You can see it's just got comments that you could fill in. It's got the processor type defined. It's got a bunch of configuration bits. It's got some variables. These variables are interesting. I mentioned last week that the variables are banked. Some of them exist in all banks, and these particular ones do. That's important because they belong to an interrupt handler. So when the interrupt occurs, the processor could be pointing to any bank, and you don't know which one. So you have to have at least one, and in this case, three variables, so that you can store things away and not have to worry about what bank you're in. Then you can get into the right bank and then restore it all when you come out. The reset vectors here at zero, you'll see that's just a go to main. This is the interrupt service routine. They've already given you some boilerplate code to save away all the different pieces you need to save away and get them back. This is a little tricky without disturbing anything and do a return from interrupt. So your code would go here, and then here's the main. Your code would go here. There's an example of how you would preload double EPROMs, uh, the EPROM on board and I'm not interested in that so I'm going to delete that and there's the end. I took the liberty of preparing a little something. And so now when we look 
you'll see it's a little bit different. I have a couple of variables here, out buffer and roll count. These are in more conventional parts of memory. Things below 20 have some special meaning to the processor if you're wondering why those don't start at zero. And now the interrupt handler does a little bit different. We'll come back to that. And on the main, we tell it that we don't want analog pins on port B. We move F0 into the accumulator, which is called W. You remember we talked about banking. This bank cell is a macro that expands out to two instructions on this processor that set the right bits for the bank for this particular register, Tris B. Tris B sets the direction of the B port, so it sets inputs or outputs, and in this particular case we're going to set the bottom four bits to outputs. We put that in Tris B, then we bank select for port B, which is the actual data, and we write hex A out to that output port, and we store that in out buffer later for the ISR and then we set up a timer interrupt so this basically just tells it what kind of prescaler we want some other options and we get into the interrupt control register again we got to point to it with the right bank we've got to set the global interrupt flag set the timer zero interrupt enable flag I went ahead and cleared timer zero cleared the roll count and I cleared the T0IF flag, which is the flag that will occur when there's a timer rollover. And then we just sit and loop forever. So the real work comes in in the interrupt service routine. So you can see we've selected out buffer. Really important because we don't know what bank we're in. I mean, in this program you could know that because you just basically spin and do nothing. But in an arbitrary program you don't know which bank you're in, so you really need to pick the bank no matter what here. Uh, and then we're just going to move F into the accumulator, XOR it with what's in out buffer, and leave the answer in the accumulator. Move that back to out buffer, also move it to port B. And we'll clear the pending interrupt, increment the roll counter, and then drop into the boilerplate code for returning from the interrupt service routine. So you can see the bank select stuff starts to get really dicey. Uh, if you don't do it right, you'll get strange results. Now in this particular case, you say, well, there's no bank select for port B, but that's because I know this is in bank zero, and I know bank, uh, port B is in bank zero. So I took the liberty of not changing the bits again, but a typical compiler that's not doing some pretty good global optimization will not be able to determine that, and will wind up putting the bit changes in there even to the point that you know the bank cell is not smart enough to say well I have cleared this bit earlier I don't have to clear it again I just have to set this other bit it will set both bits every time so not that you can't optimize that out but it is uh, something you gotta watch for it's also really error prone in your code if you like I say if you get those bits wrong uh, you'll have trouble so we're connected to the pick through the little Pick Kit 3, which is a programmer and a debugger that works in conjunction with some special features on the chip. So we'll go to debug, debug main project, and it's telling me that uh, I need to make sure I've really got a 5 volt device on there so it doesn't want to damage the device. I say OK, and I believe it's then going to tell me that I didn't turn the power up timer enable bit to the right state for the debugger to work and it'll change it for me if I say yes which I will and now the codes running and so if I pause you'll see that we are in fact just sitting in this loop I can press F8 and step through not very exciting since it's not doing anything there's actually some step buttons and things that you can't see over here because I've got the screen relatively small so it'll record well so you could do that with the toolbar or you can do like I'm doing now and press F8 but what we really want to do is see inside this interrupt service routine and you can't directly step into the interrupt service routine but what you can do is put a breakpoint there it's a limitation of the pick kit 3 and several of the other debugging tools that are inexpensive that I can really only put one breakpoint at a time in. 
So if I were to go, say, put a breakpoint here, you'll notice that one grays out, and now my breakpoint is here. And I can go back and put that one back. Now that one's grayed out. So you can only have one breakpoint active at a given time. I'm going to press F5, which will, sure enough, bring me to my breakpoint. So the interrupt did occur. And while we're here, you can go take a look at things like the variables. We could put a watch in here, and we could say something like, roll count. And you can see we've already had several rollovers while we've been working through the code. We can do things like look at the, uh, let's just say the TMR0 register, which is actually one of the built-in registers, SFR. So you can see it's at 71. One of the other limitations of this kind of debugging is the timer doesn't get stopped while we're stopped at a breakpoint, so that timer is still actually running. So that makes it a little tricky to debug timer code, but it's uh, usually usually good enough that you can see what's going on. And so we could step through. I'll well, see again. I've hit the one breakpoint limit, but if I clear that breakpoint, I can step through and actually see what's going on. So there we put F into the W register, and you can see up here W is F, and we're going to XOR with the out buffer. And in fact, let's put a watch on out buffer. Let's put uh, out buffer. Okay, so you can see that's a 5. So when we XOR it, it's going to leave the result in W. We're going to put it back in out buffer, so that's A. And then we're going to acknowledge the interrupt, bring the roll counter up by 1. It just went to F2. You'll see it's in red because it's changed. And we'll exit the interrupt. So all these things are are visible to us without having to actually go look at the hardware, uh, hook up LEDs or an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer. You can see everything right here. Very handy. Uh, the actual IDE is very convenient to use, very modern. It interfaces with CVS and Subversion and uh, you can do issue trackers and you know all this kind of stuff, refactoring and jumping around in your source code and you'd handle multiple projects as you saw so it's very sophisticated much more so than than you probably even need for this kind of programming but uh, very nice environment to work in uh, so it's not terribly expensive to get into that level of debugging and uh, it's a pretty nice product works really well under Linux which I was very happy about and uh, it's, it's a good job for microchips so we'll talk more about the pick in upcoming weeks but I thought you might like to see this and uh, thanks for watching